Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, hello everyone. Welcome out. Center point. So glad that you are here as we are starting this new series, Lord. Now, you know, when I'm in a jacket, I mean business. You know what I mean? Like, when I don't look like I rolled out of bed, something is up. And this series is a really important series as we're uh, heading towards Easter. Um, I wanted to make sure that as we, we got to Easter morning, that we as a church, as we worshiped together, understood the depth of who Christ is and why we worship him. Does that not sound great? And so I want to take these few weeks bringing us through this series called Lord. And Lord is kind of a strange word for us. We, we, we probably heard it in a religious context, but outside of that, it's not used in our modern vernacular anymore, right? Like you don't, you don't normally call too many people Lord, but there are still some moments where the word Lord is used. And you guys may or may not know this, depending on how long you've been out at Center Point. But I, I love a little bit of my ancestry and learning it, and I've, I've learned a lot about my Scottish ancestry. And uh, one of the things I'm very proud of is that I'm actually a Scottish lord. True story. We call it laird, but it's the same thing. Um, and it's true because if you own land in Scotland, you are a lord. Now, I may not own a large estate which is normally how you get the title Lord, but I do own five square feet of Scottish land. My youngest son, Connor, for Christmas a couple years ago, bought me my lordship right here. There's proof. Lord Brian Goddard McMillan, he got me my five square feet of Scottish land. And so I, I, mean, I have a piece of paper. Nothing makes it more official than printing it at home, that you are a Lord. And since I've gotten this, though, I've tried to change some things around my home. You know, like when I'm with my wife, I often ask her to refer to me as Lord. <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. Um, I'm, I'm still rooting that this is going to be the year. I think it's only appropriate as a Lord. I tell my kids to obey the Lord of the manor, right? Gets me absolutely nowhere. So here's just my request. As your pastor... If you are ever in Scotland, standing on my five square feet of land, which I have no idea where it is, by the way, and you take a selfie, can you just, just tag me as Lord Brian McMillan in that selfie, just, just to make this all worthwhile? You can call me Laird if that makes you more comfortable than Lord. But the thing is, is the word Lord is a really important word for us as Christians, and so, being it's not part of our normal vernacular, let's just define it real quick. Lord is someone having power, authority, or influence, a master or ruler. And really, authority, if there's one word I can hone in on on this definition, it's the authority that makes someone ultimately Lord. And on a human level, we don't have too many structures in place in the world today that gives someone the position of Lord anymore, right? Uh, uh, more and more of the world's uh, um, leaning towards a democracy of some, uh, some level or another. And if someone is in the position of Lord, semantic society, it may be called something different, it's generally because they're evil, right? Like if someone is a Lord, they have that kind of authority, chances are they're evil and they're often a dictator. And the thing is, is the reason that is, is because people can't handle the power of being a Lord. Our, our being as humanity, our nature is too corrupt. Sin will always twist power. We've seen this all throughout human history, and it doesn't even have to be on a government level. It can be on, on the local level. A, a pastor without a board is dangerous. Police without authority over them is dangerous. Teachers are dangerous without a system. CEOs are dangerous 
Any position of power can be dangerous if there isn't systems in place to make sure there's accountability to the power that you're ultimately given. And when you think about it, we need these layers of checks and balances because of our nature. I mean, who would you want in this world, name a human that you would want to actually have this power over you, this authority over you, to be Lord over you. Is there any person you can think of where you're like, I want them to be able to tell me exactly what to do and I have no authority otherwise? I mean, is there a president that we've ever had that you're like, man, I don't want democracy. I want a monarchy. I would want them to be president, unbridled of any accountability. No, no. You're like, I want Elon Musk to be Lord because I love his mind and his EVs and he's really, no, you still wouldn't want him. I want Kanye West to be Lord, I'm sorry, ye. I want ye to be ye Lord over me. No, there is no person I would ever want to be the ultimate power of the world over us, over me. Because anyone that has the capability of evil, which is everyone will always corrupt power. That's human nature, that's sin nature right there. You probably heard the quote, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And it does, because we're all with the same sin nature. So all hope seems lost of ever having a a, a full benevolent Lord that can lead appropriately, right? Well, you're smart people. You're at church. You know where I'm going with this. Only one is worthy of the title Lord. And even more importantly, already holds the position of Lord. And his name is Jesus. Amen. His name is Jesus. So I want to spend the next three weeks after today understanding what this means And it has to start with understanding why should Jesus be Lord? So if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Philippians chapter two. Philippians chapter two. We're gonna start in verse five. And by verse six, the apostle Paul wrote Philippians. In this particular section, we don't know if Paul wrote it himself, but as many believe someone else wrote it, and he's taking this this common poem or, or, or creed of the early church and inserting it into his letter. But for the sake of ease, I'm just gonna say since Paul did write it into his letter that these are Paul's words, even though he may not have been the originator of it, to understand why Jesus is worthy of being Lord. Philippians 2, starting at verse five. Paul writes, <clears throat> in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in the appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So I want to spend our time breaking this down for you. I think there's three specific points here that are going to help us understand why Jesus should be Lord of our life. And here's the first one. Jesus is Lord because he was and is God. He's Lord because he was and is God. God. Let me reread Philippians 2 5, where we learn this. Again, it says, In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So, Paul's setting this up as uh, uh, the reason that we need to be humble as Christians with one another. And then he says this about Jesus He says, Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So, so let me break that down. Right off the bat, Paul is reminding his readers, he's reminding us that Jesus is equal to God the Father. He has the very same nature, the same power. Jesus has always existed because Jesus is God. 
And of course, this brings us to the complex and challenging mental exercise of trying to understand the Trinity. Has anyone here fully grasped the Trinity? I've been a pastor now for 25 years, a Christian off and on. There was that season when I was younger for 45 years. And I will tell you, I still wrestle with the Trinity because the Trinity is mind-blowing for me as a human. Because the Trinity tells us this, that there is one God existing in three persons. And so if I could take a moment here to summarize the nature of the Trinity, it would be this. If you're a note taker, I want you to write these three things down real quick or take a picture as they come on the screen. Because here's what it means that we serve and worship a triune God. The first is that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct persons. The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit are distinct persons, which means each of the Trinity are unique to themselves, their own personhood, their own personality, uh, the way that they operate. They are distinct persons. All right, easy enough. Until we get to the second point of the Trinity, because each of the Trinity is fully God, not a third of God, not a part of God. That's why most of our analogies of the Trinity don't work, like an egg, the hard shell, then the, the, the white part, and then the yolk. There's three distinct parts. But the thing is, is that each part of the Trinity is fully God, not part of God, which brings us to the third part, which that is there is only one God. There are not three gods. There is not... One God in three parts. There is this conundrum for us as humanity trying to wrap our heads around something that seems like a complete uh, um, nonsensical idea that makes no logical sense for us as humanity. And I clearly don't have the time to walk through all of scripture that I believe proves in my very strong opinion on this, without a shadow of a doubt, that these three aspects of the Trinity are in fact a reality for our God. But I will say this because I, I think it's at least important to give you one thing as we head out on this idea. The Bible never uses the word Trinity, but the Bible from the very beginning in Genesis all the way through Revelation shows us time after time the reality that our God is a triune God. And when Jesus in the Great Commission, his last words to his disciples as they're now going to start what we know as the church, he sends them out on a triune message of God. He sends them out on a Trinitarian understanding of who God is. Because he says to them in Matthew 28, 18 and 19, he says, and Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's starting off by presenting the reality that there is one God, but our one God is in um, three persons. And the very basis of the church begins with the understanding that we serve a triune God. Now, if you're out there, Maybe you've been a Christian your whole life. Maybe you're new to church and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Hold up, Brian, because I have some hangups on this because it seems illogical to me. Like, I don't understand. Like, this, this makes absolutely no sense. Is God schizophrenic? <laughs> like, is he that confused? Like, what is going on? And this is a hangup for you of serving Jesus and putting your faith into the word of God. I just want to remind you one thing that I, I hold to so dearly and I think is so critical for us as Christians. I need to remind you that there is mystery in God that a finite being should absolutely not understand. If you could wrap your head around God, the Alpha and the Omega, the God who is outside of time, God who is all powerful. If you could wrap your mind around the full nature of God, then he would not be that special. If you got it, you're like, oh yeah, God's easy to understand. Then how big is God? I mean, if you're confused about inception, but you want to understand everything about God, that's something wrong with us, right? 
It's like he is God when we're trying as finite creatures to understand something that goes well beyond anything that we could ever comprehend. We only know what God has revealed to us in scripture in a way that we can at least have an understanding of him. But trust me, God is so much bigger, so much grander, so much more mysterious than anything we could ever comprehend this side of the grave. Amen? God is mysterious. And you're not going to comprehend every part of his character and his nature and his being because we are so limited compared to who he is. I mean, do you know the highest IQ in the world right now is 263? 263, I'll give you some understanding. Mine is 18, all right? So that's, (laughs) it's a big jump, but 263, like that's brilliant. I can't fathom an IQ of 263, get an IQ of 263 to God, I, I, I mean, you're not even still getting close. The most brilliant human mind still can't even come close to comprehending the awesomeness of our God. I don't know what it is about us that we want to make God so, so understandable that he doesn't have all power and all mystery. Like, we're, we're that wonderful as humanity. Like, oh, yeah, our minds are that sharp that we can understand all the mysteries of the world. We can't. And if there's one thing that science is revealing to us on a daily basis as knowledge is doubling so quickly, it's that there is most of the universe we have no understanding of yet. Yet people let the fact that God is mysterious be a hang up for them, that makes no sense if we want to talk about logic. Now God is beyond our comprehension. So don't let the idea of the Trinity distract you from God, but let it do this, keep you in awe of God. God, thank you that I can't comprehend you. Thank you that this is beyond me. Thank you that you are not mortal. (laughs) Thank you for being amazing. So Jesus is Lord because he is God. Yet Jesus is Lord because he gave up his life. Jesus is Lord because he gave up his life. Look at verses seven and eight. Told you, I had to wear the jacket today. You get into the Trinity, you have to wear like a professor coat. You just need to. Seven, rather, he made himself nothing by by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So Jesus, get this, Jesus didn't make his deity about himself. Now you may be in church long enough now where this doesn't have you drop your draw, drop your jaw. (laughs) You may have been around long enough where you just kind of hear that and you're like, yeah, of course, that's like 101. But friends, the fact that Jesus didn't make his deity about himself that he humbled himself beyond what the English language could capture, that he took on a posture of a servant and then our God died a criminal's death on a cross is beyond remarkable. Friends, maybe you're here today and you don't believe in Jesus. You're you're here with a friend, you're here with a spouse. Uh, You're here because you heard there's free coffee, you know, and... You're like, I just, I want to go. I like the people. I get that. And you're here and you don't believe in Jesus uh, and you don't believe in the Christian faith. As I, as I explain this idea, this concept of who God is and what Jesus has done for us, you have to at least admit that if this was true, this would be absolutely amazing, right? Like that is a remarkable idea that the creator becomes the creation, not even as the king on earth, but as a servant on earth, not to rule and have everyone just do what he says, but to serve humanity, to be willing to die on a cross. It's mind blowing. You know, one of my favorite genres of literature, of storytelling is sci-fi and fantasy. I'm a big sci-fi fantasy nerd. Like I, I love it. I eat it up. I love just kind of pushing my mind to to see things very differently than the world that we live in. And so I I will read a lot and watch a lot. 
And recently I was watching this, this one sci-fi short. They just had about five, six minute stories on themselves, different writers, different producers, and they were all different kind of ideas and philosophies and, and all of that. And I'm watching this. And, and one of them about halfway through was about God. And it was interesting because this person clearly was, was most likely a, an atheist or agnostic. And they were just kind of sharing in the story how they perceive God and there was a, a room, and in the room was God, and someone that was kind of like God's general. And then there was a big table that represented the world, and on the table you had humanity doing its thing. And it started very early off, and, and uh, uh, you know, a, a really early stage of humanity, and, and humanity started to grow. And God's kind of in the corner on his chair, and he's watching this happen. He's like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, they've made fire. I'm so excited they made fire. Oh, look, they're, they're not making some tools. That's fascinating. And then God gets to the point where the population starts to grow and he looks at his general and goes, I'm bored. Let's make a volcano erupt. And so God orders his general, his general, like, are you sure, God? And God's like, yes, absolutely. Let's kill most of them. And a volcano erupts and kills a whole bunch of the people until there's only a few left. He goes, let's let them repopulate now. And they start to repopulate and they start to get bigger and they keep advancing as civilization as civilization has done. And God looks and he gets bored again. He's like, now let's send a plague. I'd love a good plague right now. And the general looks at God like, are you sure? God's like, yes, it's my creation. Do with it as I wish. And so the general sends a plague and most of human, uh, the humanity at that time dies and a few left. He's like, let's let them repopulate as they do until he could do yet another travesty to people. And you see God the whole time just being nonchalant and carefree and just saying, I don't care what happens to them. I'm here, they're there, they're my creation. I don't really care about them. And I think a lot of people perceive God in that way. That he's cold, that he's distant, that we're just here if he did exist at all, just for his amusement and our pain. I think a lot of people view God that way. And that's why the words of Paul here are so absolutely important because they paint the reality of God that couldn't be further than that idea that God is cold and distant and didn't care. Hear him again. It says that God, uh, this is God, that he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Friends, let me ask you, does that sound like a cold and distant God to you? Or does that sound like a God who loves you so much that he would do whatever it takes to get you right with him and have you to spend eternity with him. No, friends, Jesus wasn't in heaven saying, I don't care about them. What a waste. No, Jesus became our sin when he died on that cross so that we could become his righteousness, which means we could become morally pure. He did this so that we could in fact be with him. He did this so the sin that we should uh, deserve our punishment for is completely removed. Jesus took that on the cross for us so that we could be made pure, that we can be made morally right so that we can now be able to have eternity with him, he loves you so much, friend. The pastor, writer, and theologian, N.T. Wright, about this section of Philippians says this. He says, Jesus didn't regard this equality, being the equality with the Father, as something to take advantage of, something to exploit. Rather, the eternal son of God, the one who became human as Jesus of Nazareth, regarded his equality with God as committing him to the course he took, of becoming human, of becoming Israel's anointed representative, of dying under the weight of the world's evil. This is what it meant to be equal with God. As you look at the incarnate son of God dying on the cross, the most powerful thought you should think is... This is the true meaning of who God is. He is the God of self-giving love. Amen, church? I don't know who needs to hear this today and who thinks God doesn't care about you, 
and who thinks God has thrown evil your way, the person out there who thinks God would never think twice about you, please hear me. That is a definitive lie of the devil. God loves you. You are made in his image. And Jesus died on a cross for what you've done wrong. That's how much he loves you. He took your sin so that you could have his righteousness, so that you could be made new. He loves you, friend. And so Paul then concludes with this third point. We learn that Jesus is Lord because he will be glorified forever. Look at verses 9, 10, and 11 with me. It says, Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Friends, because Jesus entered humanity as a servant without privilege, without power, and he gave up his life for us. Paul then says, therefore, as a result of that, Jesus is now the name above all names. The name above all names, which means Jesus is Lord. He is all powerful. He is all authority. He is above all things. What no human could possibly do when no person could possibly handle the power and the responsibility to rule with all authority, hear me, Jesus can do it. He can be Lord. You see, he can't be corrupted. He can't be bribed. He can't let the power go to his head. He can't be insecure. He can't abuse his power for his own gain. No, Jesus is perfect and he leads perfectly, which makes him the perfect Lord worthy of all worship. Amen. And now, and now he leaves it up to you and me. He leaves it up to us to make him Lord of our life or to choose not to. Yet even in that, there is a little irony because the truth is no matter who you are, no matter what you do with your life, he is actually already Lord over you. The only question is, have you submitted to his lordship or not? But make no mistake about it. As scripture says, he is already Lord over all. Adrian Rogers, the pastor says, you don't make him Lord. He's Lord already. You just recognize it. He's already in that position, friend. And see, the scripture says that every knee will bow. Everyone's gonna take the knee. Every tongue will confess but it also says it just may not be in this lifetime. That's what it means when he says, whether in heaven or on earth or under the earth. He's saying whether those that have already died and they've already given their life to Christ and now they're in heaven or those that are like you and I that are alive right now or those that have or will pass away, eventually every soul, every being will know this truth because it is the universal truth that Jesus is Lord. And you're gonna confess that. But hear me, friends, trust me on this. Please wrestle through this because you don't want this information to come to you once you realize that you are under the earth because then it's too late. And whether that simply means death or is what I believe it means, you have now been eternally separated from God from never putting your faith in Christ in the first place. Everyone, no matter where they are, are gonna come to this realization that Jesus is Lord, that he is God, that he has made a way for us to be with the Lord forever, to be with God forever. But friends, you don't wanna come to that knowledge after you've died. Now is the moment. Now is the moment to wrestle with it. In the last couple of years, we've had more deaths in the history of our church than in the, the first 17, 18 years. Every death has just been a reminder of the vapor of life, the speed of life. This is not one of those things where you're gonna be like, you know what, I'm in college right now. If I make him Lord, I may have to change some things about what I'm doing on my weekends. 
I'm going to put this off. You know what? I've just started my family, and I, I'm too busy right now. I just, I don't have, I'm fighting with my spouse. I, I got these, I love my kids, but they're so annoying. I just now, now isn't the time for me to wrestle with this. You know, I'm heading towards retirement. I, I, I'm about to be retired. That'll be the perfect time to finally, like, really own if this is true or not. So at the end of the day, you do not know. You do not know that last minute of breath that you will take. This isn't something to push off, to wrestle through in another day. Church, we must wrestle with this now. And this isn't just for those that are new to the idea of who Christ is. This is for all of us. Because I'm going to tell you what a lot of us as Christians have been doing in our life. We've been part of church. We've let Jesus kind of sprinkle into our life. Uh, we go to our life group. We, we, we go to church. We, we do these different religious activities. And, and we've put our faith in Jesus. Because here's what I find. A lot of us love Jesus as Savior, Jesus, I'm hurting. I'm, I realize I've sinned. My, my life is astray. Uh, things, are, things are not going the way that I need. I, I, I have this pain. I have this addiction. I, I have these struggles. And you, for whatever thing brings you there, you're finally like, Jesus, I need a savior. Jesus, save me. Jesus, forgive me. Like, that is amazing. And you're like, man, I love Jesus as my friend, right? Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my savior, Little cultural inside joke there for some of us. But you're like, I love, I love my Jesus as my friend. He's my bro. We, you know, yes, thank you. We like Jesus on this level. And this is good. You need this. This is great. He is our friend. But what too many of us are afraid of actually now doing in the church, saying, now, Jesus, I'm going to give you everything. Jesus, I want you to be Lord of my life, all authority in my life, that I'm not gonna pick and choose what in the word of God I like and don't like. I'm not gonna give you parts of my life and not other parts of my life. No, Jesus, you are the authority. Because here's what a lot of us in the church, including myself and in different areas, what we do. We look at our life and we look at our, maybe our, our, our title on our house, our car, our social media followers. We we look at our family, we look at our, a ring on a finger, we look at our career, we, we look at our friend circle, we look at our, our retirement, we look at these different things and we're like, listen, I'm Lord over that part of my life. I have a piece of paper that proves it. I have a bank account that shows it. I, I have thousands of, of followers that tells me that I am Lord over that part of my life. Look, it says it right here. Lord over my career. I'm doing well. You know, here's the funny thing about this little piece of paper. It's nonsense, right? Like this, I'm not Lord uh, uh, in Scotland. I went to Scotland right now and I went to Parliament. I'm like, hey, by the way, I'm Lord Brian McMillan. Let me in, <laughs> right? I wanted to see the queen. I'm like, oh, no, no, you don't understand. I'm, I'm Lord Brian Goddard McMillan. You, let, let me see the queen. I, I know she's not feeling well right now, but I'm Lord Brian. No, this means nothing. I bet you I don't even have a, a plot anywhere, a five foot square foot area of land in Scotland. I bet you that there's some 23 year old in his mom's basement making millions of dollars off fools like me who are buying this little certificate that you print at home and it means absolutely nothing. There's no value. I'm actually not Lord, no matter what this says. And what a lot of us have done within our Christian walk as we have areas of our life, we're like, oh, no, no, I'm actually Lord over that because. And I want you to hear, friends, that's a lie. Jesus is Lord over every part of your life. Every single part. The question is, have you accepted that he is Lord over it? Or are you still holding on to the lie that you are Lord over it? Over the next few weeks, we're going to understand what that means. We're going we're to really break that down and wrestle with it. But I want you to know, church, that if you are a Christian, Jesus needs to be the supreme authority in your life. 
He needs to be the great influence that dictates all other aspects. That what he says, you say, I will do. That where his ways are your ways. Where all of these other things that are so good in themselves are are first seen through the lordship of Jesus and not throwing him at the end, hoping that it's what he wants for us. He needs to be Lord of all. I want to just close with a verse in Romans chapter 10. Paul says this, he says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And here's my challenge to us, church. Don't leave today without knowing that you've put your faith in Christ. And for us as a congregation, that we want him to be the Lord of this church and of our life. I'm gonna ask you to stand because I wanna pray for us. I'm gonna call the worship team up. And I'm going to ask everyone to just shut your eyes and bow your heads for a moment. And maybe as I, I shared this story, it, it, my, uh, my message today, and you, you heard about the, the reality of God and who Jesus is and how much he loves you, maybe there's someone here today that for the first time realized that you've never actually put your faith in Jesus. You've never asked him to be your savior. You, you never accepted the fact that he died on a cross for your sin. And you, you firmly know you're not, you're not going to shy away from the fact that you know that there's evil in your life. Bible calls evil sin, that it's there. And you want to take that first step of faith today. Well, I want to just say a prayer and I want you to pray along with me in your mind, your heart. And if you're comfortable out loud, if not, that's fine. But I want this day to pass that you haven't taken this first step. And so just repeat after me. Jesus, I come before you today. And I acknowledge the sin in my life. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. Forgive me. Now show me how to live for you. Friends, if you've said that prayer for the very first time, you've taken that step for the first time, will you just, with every head bowed, I show, will you just raise your hand for me for a moment? Just... Just let me know. Just let, let me see that. Amen. Amen. See so many hands that are raised right now. I just want to thank God for those hands and for that moment. And then I want to just pray for us as a church. That, that making Jesus Lord and understanding it is one of the greatest shifts that will ever happen in your faith. And so, Jesus, I, I lift up center point. I lift up each every one of our people, no matter where we are in our understanding of you, in, in this journey of growing closer to you. God, I just pray that we will be a people that realizes that, that we cannot be Lord of our own life, that we have to stop holding this fake piece of paper that we think uh, gives us lordship over things that, that truly don't matter in the light of your glory and your grace. And instead of putting you at the end of our life, may we put you first in our life. First in our singleness, first in our marriages, first in our workplace, first in our our schooling, God, first in our hobbies, first in everything that we do, that you are Lord. And that we see everything through that lens, saying, is this what God would want me to? to do. Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. We honor you. You are Lord of Lords. And all God's people said, amen. Amen, church.